Welcome to the Truth and Liberty broadcast. We believe we have a mandate to bring godly change to our nation and the world through the seven spheres or mountains of influence. To further this cause, we give away a product every week that will empower you to get involved in changing your life and changing our world. You can register for our weekly giveaway by subscribing at truthandliberty.net. You can also subscribe to our newsletter to receive weekly updates on guests, news, and much more. This is an interactive live cast and we welcome your questions. To ask a question during the live cast, use the comment or chat features. Now get ready to dive into this week's topics with our hosts on location in Colorado, USA. Hello and welcome to Truth and Liberty. My name is Mark Coward. I'm setting in for Andrew Womack tonight and we are gonna have an amazing broadcast, trust me. But uh, I'm also joined here with Richard Harris, who really knows the broadcast well and keeps everything on track. <laughs> I'll do <laughs> so, my best. <laughs> so anyway, we have a special guest tonight, Richard, who has just been someone I have admired a very long time. Amen. Mario Murillo is yes. going to be with us. And I'm telling you, buckle your seatbelt. This is going to be so powerful. Uh, before we get into that, we've got some announcements to share with you. So Richard, you're going to take that and uh, then we'll start our conversation with right. Mario. Yeah, that sounds great, Mark. I'm so glad you're with us and so glad Mario Murillo is with us. I, I might have said this last time he was on, but I, I want everybody to know that when I was uh, first got uh, kind of turned on to God, one of the very first Christian books I read was Fresh Fire by Mario Murillo and how it just motivated me to get out there and win souls. And I just love this guy for reasons he probably doesn't even realize. But how about some announcements here? <laughs> um, listen, if you're watching tonight on Facebook and that's awesome or on YouTube, that's great. But I want to encourage you to watch directly on our website at truthandliberty.net because you'll have a reliable experience there and you won't be able to be censored. Uh, we had a video recently taken down by the uh, know-it-alls at YouTube who felt like that Pastor Che on of California was, uh, you know, what he said uh, couldn't be permitted. So watch directly on our website if you would. And speaking of our website, you need, if you haven't done it, you need to check out our resources page there. Did you know we have a 24-7 news feed where we pull from our favorite conservative news sources? You don't, you don't have to go anywhere else. Just pull up the Truth and Liberty news feed and you can see all the headlines from a conservative, reliable perspective there, as well as many other resources that we have on on uh, the variety of issues that are important uh, to believers out there. So check that out. Hey, coming up here at Andrew Womack Ministries, we've got some awesome events coming up. One of my favorite events of the year is the Men's Advance, and that is on March 11th through the 13th here in Woodland Park at Karis Bible College. Andrew will be ministering along with James J.B. Brown, you know, of CBS Sports and NFL football, and Tony Dungy, the Super Bowl winning coach of, uh, uh, I think it was the Indianapolis Colts at the time. Yeah. Anyway, I'll, we'll say, just say yes. Richard. Well, I'm not the big sports guy, but these are <laughs> men of God. I will they tell are you men that. of God and they can preach and bring the word and it's going to be awesome. So check that out on awmi.net. And then also God with us, uh, an Easter performance of an amazing drama written by Robert and Elizabeth Murin that tells the story of Israel from the perspective of Peter, the apostle Peter. And it is a fantastic Broadway quality level production. That's on April 2nd through the 4th. Uh, uh, here and again in Woodland Park, and you can get more information on our website. And then Karis Bible College Campus Days, April 7th through the 9th, uh, here also at Karis. Uh, you'll want to check that out, and uh, that's going to be an awesome event, too. I um, wanted to mention that uh, if, you, if you're not a subscriber to Truth and Liberty, uh, we invite you to become one, and then you can receive our, our periodic updates and various information that we send out, action items and, and special news reports and opinion pieces and stuff like that, and just go on our website, the upper right hand corner and click subscribe. And uh, when you do, you'll receive a uh, um Actually, not a, uh, you'll, you'll be eligible to receive our free product giveaway. Last week, we gave away Lessons from David, Andrew's book about David. Uh, and the winner of that was John Freyer. Uh, I hope I'm saying your name right, John. But you should be getting an email from us shortly. And if you'll respond to that, we'll get that book right to you. This week's giveaway is Andrew's, one of his latest books. It's called More Grace and More Favor. Andrew, he's so... Uh, 
humble. It's, it, he, this book is about humility. Andrew says, well, I wanted to call it humility, but the publisher said I wouldn't sell any books if I did it that way. So he's calling it more of grace and more favor. And that comes out of the epistle of First Peter, where he says that God opposes the proud, but gives grace unto the humble. So subscribe today and you'll be eligible to receive that book. Truth and Liberty is an interactive uh, broadcast, and we want to hear from you tonight. Post your comments and your questions. We'll do our very best to get to those questions. Uh, and you can do that in the comment section on Facebook or the chat function on our website. And also want to say thank you to all of our partners out there, our, our members of the Truth and Liberty Coalition, and thank you for your generosity. If you'd like to support what God is doing here at Truth and Liberty, you can sign up to be a member on our website. Just go to the donate page and uh, sign up to make a recurring monthly contribution of at least $5 per month. And if you do, we'll send a free gift to you in the mail. And uh, just remember that because we're a 501c4 organization, your uh, donations unfortunately are not tax deductible, but we, we do know that God notices and uh, he will reward you openly. And last thing tonight is if you need prayer, you need someone to agree with you in prayer. We have trained spirit filled word of God filled and trained uh, ministers standing by. Just call in at 719-635-1111 and someone will We'll agree with you in prayer. And that's it. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I tell you, Richard, I can't tell you how much I've been looking forward to having Mario on. I don't think I've ever done this. I think I want to read this first little paragraph. There's so much to say about okay. Mario, but we, we need to read this because I don't know. Some of you may not know the background that he came from, but it says everything about Mario Murillo defies the odds. He's a native of San Francisco, a city not known for producing international evangelist. His ministry was born in the drug-obsessed, occult-saturated 70s in the epicenter of violent student revolution, Berkeley, California. His gift seemed doomed to fail on an atheistic campus. Mix in persuasive gospel messages with the raw healing power of Jesus, the unexpected result was a vibrant army of 2,000 students. I tell you, Mario, we want to welcome you. Thank you yes. for being with us tonight. It is a blessing, and I've been looking forward to this. Well, I'll tell you what, I couldn't be more, let's just say, honored to be with you both. And uh, Mark and Richard, I really believe the Lord is going to anoint this broadcast for our, our audience. Yes. There's going to be something said tonight that is specifically for you that are watching. It's going to change your life. It's going to make a difference. And I believe it's going to answer some very, very deep questions. Lord's had me doing that a lot lately. Mm. It, what I did at Berkeley was impossible. The Lord did it. You have to give him all the glory. But what I want to say at the front is that we're in that same era now. These Marxists that we see now, I know all those boys. They're not new to me. <laughs> this gang is, I, I was, I've got the t-shirt, I've been there. <laughs> and I know what to say. And I know that God is going to give the church in America Amen. a shocking victory, just like we had at Berkeley. Amen. Well, Mario, I have to say this. And, you know, we were prime in the pump uh, prior, you know, we get on early, check everything out. And I'll tell you, we could give the benediction and go home now and we would be blessed. But one of the things that, uh, and I mean this with all of my heart, and I told you, the word says flattery is a sin. So this is not flattery, but your preaching and your blogs that you write are some of the most powerful I've ever read. And if it's true that the pen is mightier than the sword, then your pen is a double-edged sword. And uh, I want to start from the beginning for all the listening audience, Richard. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're not signed up to get Mario Murillo's blogs, you need to go to mariomurillo.org and get signed up. And I mean it, it's not fluff. It's not just something to fill the space. Mario, it feeds my spirit. It does something to me. It's an impartation and there's faith that comes. And one of the things I want to say, and I, I got to tell you, I just read it the other day, and you told the story about your mom, and she just went to be with the Lord. And honestly, when I read the story, because I read it, and I love the way that you wrote it, I didn't know who you were talking about. And when I finished that blog, which they're usually about a page, I thought, that's why Mario has that anointing. Do you mind referencing a little bit of 
what it was that your mom and your environment and the fact you're sitting here tonight with us is an absolute miracle of God? You know, everything about my mom is just, uh, it should be a novel because you see, she was raised in wealth in Nicaragua and they had to forsake the nation during the revolution and uh, they confiscated all their property. Now you know why I'm against communism and socialism because I had an inheritance that was stolen in Nicaragua that I didn't even know about. My, grand, my great grandfather was the general of the Nicaraguan army. My aunt Chela was the secretary to the US ambassador to Nicaragua. And uh, so we were the family of the intelligentsia and they lost everything. And so it was her mom, my, my, mom's, uh, my mom and her young husband, who was German, they came to San Francisco, they immigrated. They, they got in line and did it right. And she went from having a new dress every Sunday for church to now working in the sweatshops in San Francisco at that time in the 40s for 10 cents an hour. And she had already had my older brother, Roger, and uh, now a year later, she was about to have me. And the doctor said, you're too poor mm. to have another child. And you can imagine what abortion was like in the 40s. Mm. It was an illegal procedure, was in the back, back alleys. But this doctor said, I'm gonna recommend this for you because you're just so poor. And she went home devastated, realizing she was poor, had one one-year-old child about to have a second one. And she put the Bible on her belly every night and began to pray over her stomach and say, God, I don't know if this child is going to be male or female, but I want you to use this child. So instead of getting an abortion, she had me. Hmm. And later she remarried and uh, had six more children, there are eight of us, and she raised them in the inner city. Was an astonishing woman. And uh, to tell you, she could cook Latin food. There are people that are gonna understand this. My mom made a chili relleno that gave you visions of God. <laughs> and uh, when she, we were, all of the family was grieving years ago when my mom said, I'm never, no longer going to make tortillas by hand. I'm not going to do it anymore. Because I remember as a child when that aroma would fill the whole house. It was amazing. And we never felt poor. But I knew that the hand of God was on me. I didn't fit uh, until one day it was overwhelming at the age of 16 when I met Christ yeah. in, in the inner city. And from that moment on, I never, I hit the ground running, never stopped, never looked back, never let go of the plow, never let backed up or apologized. And, and I have my mom to thank for that. And she, she went to heaven six days ago and it was tough. There were some things I had to cancel because I had to regroup. But I tell you what, I feel her presence in heaven. I know that God is with her and she was an amazing woman. Her name was Christina, Christina mm. Murillo. What an amazing mom, I miss you mom. Mm. <laughs> and what wow. an amazing story. That just right. touches the depth of my heart. Right. And uh, what a testament to the fact, because I've heard so many times that people say, well, people are so poor, you need to give them that right to choose and abort that baby. Brother, all I can say is I'm sure glad it didn't happen and that you're here now because your whole background, your acquaintance, you really understand the impact of communism and Marxism. Yes, I do. And uh, boy, I wish we had five hours tonight to just pull everything we could out of you. You're in California, Mario. And yes, sir. I think Richard, some of the cases that we've seen, the worst oppression uh, and tyranny, it may be soft tyranny, but it's tyranny nonetheless, um, is taking place in California. It's, it's like out of control. And uh, I read in one of your blogs, you've called for some pastors to get together and you just have such a boldness about you and an anointing to speak the truth. Tell us what's going on in California and how the Lord's using you and what you see happening. 
Well, thanks to a pastor of Canyon Hills Assembly in Bakersfield, we were able to resist the oppressive lockdown of California, put up a tent in the heart of Bakersfield. This is Wendell Vinson, Canyon Hills Assembly of God, a mighty church. They helped us. We ended up watching 1,700 people sign decision cards for Christ in Bakersfield. That's, that's unprecedented in the pandemic, and the city did not shut us down, and now we're moving on to bigger and better. But based on the momentum and the fire that we saw in Bakersfield, the Lord told me to go up to Modesto, and we are going to be with Bishop Steve Perea at Christian Worship Center in Manteca to do a luncheon. The only way we could do this luncheon is he's taking every last seat out of his sanctuary because unbeknownst to us, I said, look, I have a word from God for you pastors about fire, about reopening your church, about resisting the government, about doing the right thing, about making your life count. Would you come? And I expect our biggest pastor's luncheon at that point was 100. This one is at 1,000 right now. 1,000 tickets have been printed out and churches from all over the state are coming to hear this word. And, and I love the date. It's on March the 4th. You see, we're going to march forth on March the 4th. I love <laughs> that's it. the date mm -hmm. I picked because I knew that that's what God wants the army to. You know, we sing this song, there's an army rising up, right? And I told people in the tent, I said, look, I've never seen an army take so long to rise up. And then we hear this song, I'm no longer a slave to fear, but I'm gonna stay away from church because of a virus. So the issue in this hour is boldness and fire and resisting the powers of darkness because God is gonna save this country. I believe California is gonna have another revival. Mm -hmm. I believe it. It's gonna be, another. this is the state of Azusa Street, Amy McPherson, Billy Graham, Calvary Chapel. I can go on Trinity Broadcasting Network, full gospel businessmen, and, and think of all the things God has done in California. And there's one more coming, and it's going to be a tidal wave uh, that will sweep across the nation. I just believe it. Wow. Well, you know, Mario, I appreciate the things you said in there. You, you mentioned there won't be skinny jeans, fog machines, and a whole bunch of other stuff. You, it, this is cutting to the chase, and the fact that you have over a thousand pastors that are ready to come to this. Um, what, you know, in the midst of this, I had some folks, more than one, leave our church because, you know, Richard, we've walked through a lot of things here in Colorado together. Andrew's been a big target, lawsuits and all of that. So, you know, this thing breaks out and for a season, we don't meet at church. Everything goes online, but we made the decision Pentecost Sunday, March or May 31st, we opened back up and I had people that said, you need to obey the governor. And, and so they ended up, we've had people leave the church because of that. What do you say to people that, you know, because they, they talk about Romans chapter 13 and obeying the governing authorities. I'm sure you've dealt with that, but what do you say to pastors now uh, that have had all this put out to them? How have you been addressing that? You know, you just threw me a T-bone steak, so <laughs> you just did. And, and, and I'm going to tell you what. In Romans 13, the biggest misunderstanding of that verse is that no one really stops and reads what it is saying and who it is referencing. But in verse 3, there's a phrase that tells you everything. It says the authorities that are from God are not a threat to the righteous. Mm -hmm. So here's the deal. When an authority is a threat to the righteous, another truth kicks in. And it's this one. Whether it is right to obey you rather than God, you decide. But we cannot help but speak of the things which we've both seen and heard. See, Hitler mm -hmm. was not God's will for Germany. And if we take this ruling authority abuse wrong, let me tell you what I have to do. When I go into L.A., I have to deal with a group called the Soreños. It's a, it's, a, it's a drug gang. It's a big one. And they control entire neighborhoods. They are the law. 
So when I go into Soreno neighborhoods to win the loss, am I submitting to the ruling authority? No, I'm not. I'm not going to submit to a drug gang. Now, let me tell you about Governor Gavin Newsom, who went to the French Laundry to have a birthday party with no social distancing while he's telling all the churches they have to be shut down. Or let's talk about Nancy Pelosi, who literally went and had her hair done in a salon that later went bankrupt because of her lockdown. Mm. So it was like this. We're better than you are. We're different than you are. We're an elite force. Jesus looked at Herod and said, you fox. He called him a fox. Mm. Let me tell you, that is a derogatory term. But the, what it comes down to is that we are to obey God rather than man. That's why Andrew said, we're going to open up. Because you, and, and this is what a, I, I dealt with a very high level politician. I'm going to tell you this and I'll make it quick. But it, you guys have got me on fire, so this is your fault. <laughs> so <laughs> so the, the fact is, th this guy looked at me and he, he gave me the, the whole spiel. He said, you're breaking the law. I said, as a matter of fact, I'm the one obeying the law. Because the, my constitution tells me that I have the right to assemble and I have the freedom of religion. I don't say freedom of worship because liberals use that against us. They say, okay, you can worship God in the forest. That's not what we're talking about. The freedom to open the church doors and operate. Now you kept Costco open. You kept Sam's Club open. Why couldn't you have kept the church open? You could have found a way, but their hatred for the church uh, Richard and Mark was a pre-existing condition mm -hmm. and they were rogue government. Anyway, I could go on forever, but anyway, <laughs> well, that's what, I, that's what I want to say to that. And you made a key statement. Most people don't know this constitution is the supreme law of the land. And most people in America have never read the constitution. Richard and I actually helped start and birth the practical school of government. I'm still the director. And then you got pulled over here. Mm -hmm. So you taught the Constitution, Richard. Right. And I would guarantee most politicians probably haven't read it. And we haven't taught it to our children. Therefore, we have people stepping in and making laws that are contrary to the supreme law of the land. They're illegal. Yeah. And we've got a we've got a problem on our hands now. So what are you hoping to accomplish out of this meeting with the pastors? What do you feel the Lord's put in your heart and what this what fruit will this bear? What are you seeing? You know, uh, I don't I don't know how to do this without getting in trouble. All right. <laughs> so I'm going to do it. Have you ever been in a in a fight in, at school in the schoolyard? Uh, I'm asking the audience. It's a, 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 obviously a rhetorical question. So it isn't when the guy says your mama that starts the fight. That isn't what starts it. It's the guy standing behind you who all of a sudden hears your mother insulted and he goes, oh, <laughs> and that starts the fight. And when the when the church Pastor, when the, when the government told you to shut your church, told you you couldn't preach against sin, told you that you had to compromise everything you believed, the Holy Ghost was standing behind you and he went, ooh, <laughs> <laughs> because that's exactly the moment we're in. I want to I tell you what I'm going to oh, tell these pastors, because I want to say it to everyone watching. Oh. If enough of us obey God, there is no way they can stop us. They can't arrest all of us. They can't arrest every, I, I said, I look there, I said, if a thousand pastors open their church in California, you are literally going to dilute their resources. They cannot stop you. This is the part that really bothers me, is the body of Christ in America already has the power to put this wokeness to sleep, to turn this whole situation around, if just enough of us would get up. So the problem uh, Brother Mark, Brother Richard, isn't the Democrats. It's the sleepy church. It's mm -hmm. the divided church. It's the compromised pastor who wants a big church and doesn't want any trouble. Hides behind the goodness of God as an excuse to, to abdicate his authority as a shepherd to say this. Uh, I'll tell you, I was in Fresno. We had a meeting of several hundred uh, Christians. We packed out this church. Matter of fact, we had to borrow 200 chairs to put everybody in there. And I stood up and I couldn't believe what God had me say. 
We had 50 pastors in the room. And I said, how many in this audience? I said, raise your hand. If you've been fired from your job because you witnessed to a coworker and hands went up. I said, how many of you have children that were suspended from a California school because they wore a Christian t-shirt and hands went up? How many of you are being harassed on social media because you said you were gonna vote for Trump or you were against abortion? How many of you have been harassed and attacked and, and been driven out of associations and have family members and everyone reject you? And all these hands went up. And then I looked at the pastor and I said, what are you preaching to help these people? Are you preaching about anything that they're actually going through right now? This is an hour where if enough of us are outraged, if enough of us realize that this is wrong, it is not America, has nothing to do with with, uh, racial equality or any form of equality. It's not marriage equality thereafter. It's to destroy the church. It's to silence the truth. It's to completely uh, control our thoughts and our thinking. And there's no middle ground. Every child of God is now a soldier. And like I said before, and I'm, I'm gonna stop even because I can go another 10 minutes, why the word of faith is more relevant now than it has ever been before. Why prosperity, authority over devils, divine healing, the authority of the believer to stand in victory over emotions and mental attacks, the ability to speak the word of God with power, it's a greater moment for that than ever before. It's never been more relevant. It's more relevant now than when Brother Hagen was alive. And I believe it. And uh, I said I wasn't going to go that long. That, Again, well, I apologize, Brother. You guys are amazing. Man, uh, Mario, th- uh, I think your word right, right there was just so timely. This week in the United States Congress, there's a bill that's going to be voted on. It's H.R. 5, and it's called the Equality Act. It came up um, a couple years ago and and didn't make it because Trump promised a veto, but uh, he's not in office anymore, and there, we now have a tie in the U.S. Senate. And this law will make it um, a federal offense to refuse to hire homosexuals uh, and transgender people um, in certain Christian roles, um, it will require daycares and, and or ad- adoption agencies, Christian adoption agencies, to uh, a- allow homosexual couples to adopt children, and all sorts of other things that are contrary to our faith. And if we think COVID was bad, this deal is going to um, really put us to the test, and it's time for people to stand up and to be counted here. And you know, go ahead, Mark. Well, sorry. Mario, you you've done such a great job of just kind of framing up uh, how much abuse, how much overreach, how much really what it is. Do as I say, but don't say as I do. And so, I'm sure both of you've heard of the book uh, "How Do You Kill 11 Million People" mm. by Andy Andrews. And when I heard the title of that book, I go. That has to be the worst title for a book I've ever heard in my life. Who wants to buy a book entitled, How Do You Kill 11 Million People? And it's about how the Jews went willingly into the boxcars. And willingly, Hitler did not send his henchmen down there and pull guns on them. They went down and they said, we've got jobs waiting for you. You know, don't worry if you get separated, we'll put you back together. And I remember I used to wonder how the Jews could do it willingly. They got in the box cars, they closed the doors, and they put the locks on them. And all of a sudden, I started thinking, we're doing this in America right now. We're doing it. We're doing it. We have the law of the land in the Constitution. Well, you know, Gina Carano, the actress for Disney right. in The Mandalorian, was fired by Disney for she didn't say anything hateful. All she did was say that the, the mentality that is spreading in the cancel culture right now is the same thing that preceded the Holocaust. Yes. People have criticized her for exaggerating, but this kind of censorship and mind control, thought control, this abuse of power, is she's, she's spot on in my opinion. What do you think, well, Mario? 
You know, I think that one thing that we, to get back to this thing about political rebellion, civil disobedience, which is something we're all going to be called to do, is simple. I can say it to the audience. Once being a Christian is illegal in America, are you going to stop being a Christian? And, and you think about Daniel. They put a prayer ban in, and Daniel didn't submit. He kept praying three times a day. Now, that's not because he was rebellious. It's because they became evil. What, you, what we need to remember is the Christians didn't become political. The left became spiritual. They jumped mm. over the fence. They brought the fight to us. They told us what marriage was going to be. They told us what we could preach. And now we have to understand. Now, the most important, you know, talking about how do you kill 11 million people, I want to say, what is an American? If you as a Christian don't believe in rebelling against government, you don't believe in the existence of America. That's right. Because the Declaration of Independence was an act of rebellion. And here's what Thomas Jefferson said. We're rebelling against you, England, because your laws violate the laws of God. That is specifically what he meant, that we know that men are born with certain, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. So what is he saying? Here, you know, you, you've, you've taught the Constitution, Richard. And so the Declaration of Independence tells us specifically, when the laws of God are violated by government, it is the duty to rebel against that government. This is not a simple rebellion, folks. This is them telling you, not only do we, and it's, it's mindless, uh, Coca-Cola saying, you know, you need to be less white. So here's mm. what I wanna say, L listen to the logic. In order to create racial equality, we're gonna begin a racism against white people. Mm -hmm. So the, the devil laughs, he said, racism gets to survive. You let it mutate, just like the coronavirus got a new mutation, so does racism. Now, one other point I wanna make. Uh, Gina Carano said, uh, you can be fired for saying that you're a Republican. So what did Disney do? Fired her, proved what she said was true. This is the logic of the left, that they literally say, we're doing it for this reason when it's exactly the opposite. And we can't hold back now. We cannot hold back. Mario, you made a powerful statement. Most people don't realize our birth certificate, the Declaration of Independence, was an act of rebellion. And, you know, since my journey started back in about 2008, and, you know, then God had so many things orchestrated. I've known Andrew 43 years this year, but it was in 2015 that the connection was made, practical government <clears throat> school and all that. So I started studying about the history of our nation, and I realized it's not what is being taught that's the revisionism of our history, it's what is not being said. You brought a key point out, Mario, that it is our duty, not just a right or a privilege as a believer, but our duty to rebel against tyranny. And most people can't even process that. I think Thomas Jefferson also said, rebellion against tyrants is duty to God. And so I think we've got a wake up call coming that's a rather rude awakening. And you know, but the fact you're meeting with these pastors, one of the things I learned, I never heard this phrase until I read a three page article by David Barton, the Black Robe Regiment. I didn't know what the black robe regiment was. I thought it might have been judges. They wear black <laughs> robes. But it was that backhanded comment by the British against the clergy and the pastors. And they said, if it hadn't been for that black robe regiment, we'd have won this war and revolution. And so secular historians have verified this. This is not preacher commentary, that if it had not been for the clergy of the day or the pastors, preaching from the Word of God, there never would have been a revolution. In other words, never would have been a re rebellion. And if they had not been involved and continued, it wouldn't have been sustainable. So I personally believe, Mario and Richard, God is raising up a new modern day 
black robe regiment, and they're going to be the ones to rise up and rebel against this stuff. I love it. And they're going to be the ones to lead the charge. But the fact is, people that don't believe in rebellion to tyranny really don't believe in America because that's you know, what birthed us. You know, and I want to just add to that, if I could, something very important. Well, Mario, you're a soul winner. Uh, you don't look very loving when you condemn the government. And when you tell people to rebel against government, you're going to lose a lot of left-wing young people that could have been born again. You know what's happening? It's when I say these things and I'm preaching the gospel that young people come under conviction. Why? Why am I against Joe Biden, folks? Because his policies are not just wrong, they're evil. And it's evil. It's the object the, uh, the Bible says Jesus went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. It's an oppression of Satan. There's there, this idea that, that we should have been locked down was an oppression of Satan. You know, there was just one high school in California that because of the lockdown, they had 18 suicides on their campus from students that were locked in their houses. And now we have the science that says that for every day that you're in a lockdown in your house, it's the equivalent for your body of smoking 15 cigarettes. Oh, wow. That's what it does to your nervous system and your body. And you know, 98.5% of all people that get COVID are gonna get over it. But how many that are addicted to heroin are gonna get over it? How many that are suicidal are gonna get over it? The percentage of death is much higher. So what we're against is evil. That's what we're against. That's what the, the American, the black robe regiment was against, was the evil. The day woke up and they said, these people are evil. Quartering in our houses, uh, the British were able to live in your house, take over your property for as long as they wanted. You had to feed them and entertain them. And that was just the lighter things, the atrocities that were all through the colonies. And it's starting again, folks, and we've got We've got that moment right now where we need to wake up and do what is our duty. Wow. Well, you know, Mario, before the show, we were talking a little bit about, I don't know, kind of how did we get here, talking about what's the, what's the biggest problem in the church. And I think you were sharing an opinion that I think it'd be awesome if our viewers could hear on that. You alluded to biblical illiteracy. Can you comment on that? Yeah, uh, the number one reason that America is where she is now, is that Christians had no answer for the culture. We, they were not armed with information by their pastors. They couldn't quote the Bible. They couldn't speak the word of God. They couldn't say what the word of God said. Paul instructed the leaders, said, be ready always to give an answer for the hope that lies within you. Told Timothy, the things I've given you, commit to other men who are faithful to teach others. You know, we hear that, that pastors ought not to be exposing false doctrine. If that were true, 67% of the New Testament would be irrelevant because 67% of the New Testament is exposing, correcting false doctrine and reaffirming truth. So we had a generation that couldn't explain why gay marriage was wrong. We had a generation that couldn't explain why there shouldn't be a drag queen reading to our kids on Saturday morning at the library, or why a grown man shouldn't be allowed in a little girl's bathroom. Mm -hmm. Common sense went out the window because scripture went out from the pulpit. And the devil deceived so many leaders because they wanted a big church. They wanted size, they wanted prestige, they wanted numbers, and they didn't create the, the model that Jesus said, make disciples, go into all the nations and make disciples. And we didn't make it, and we're paying the price, a hefty price. Mario, you just have such a way of wording things. And I know we've got questions coming in that, that we're going to be getting to. I want to encourage our listening audience to get on Mario Murillo's blog. That I, Do you send that out every day or how yes. often? Yeah, yeah, every we day. We try to do a new one every day. Well, if they go to MarioMurillo.org, I want to tell you because it's not fluff, it's not cotton candy, 
it is something usually very pungent with, and Mario, I, pre I appreciate the prophetic edge that you have because I believe God has raised you up and it's so unique, your background coming from a communistic background, it affected your inheritance and yeah. you're a miracle that you're setting here, a testament that we need to choose life, obey the word of God. I, I shudder to think if you weren't here because of all of the people that have come into the kingdom. And and I'm sure, Richard, have we got questions coming We've got in some now? Questions, yes, I bet sir. it's lighting up, brother. It so is, let's get to some questions, Mario. Well, yes, I, I like this one, this first one right off the bat, Mario, and it's how should Christians be encouraged despite all the bad news they hear about America? Yeah, they should be encouraged because of American history. That's why the devil doesn't want you to know American history. Uh, there are 17 times in our history where we should have been destroyed, but at the last minute, something supernatural intervened. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. Who did that? And one day when I was in prayer, and this is so encouraging, the Lord said, I love America. I love the miracle. The American miracle is something that I love. He said, God said, I love Israel. I love the American miracle. Mm -hmm. And anyone that comes to destroy America is going to come through me. And my arm is not mm. shortened that it cannot save. You see, what we're going to, there's a good news, bad news. Here's the bad news. God is willing to take us through economic disaster. He's willing to take us through crisis. He's willing to take us through natural disasters. If the end result will be a repentant, restored, and godly America. But before the devil can destroy America, God is going to fight as fierce as a mama grizzly. And you need to know that, that God is going to do some things that none of us. Let's go back for a second and think about Trump. He wasn't supposed to win. Everybody thought Hillary was going to win. Trump was the outsider, the outlier, the uh, completely unexpected solution. And God brought it. And he's got a ton more just like that. What we're seeing in California, people are shaking their heads right now. How are you packing out church tents night after night after night? Why are the drug addicts coming? Why are the laws coming? The wealthy, the poor. You, you, you can see a bank president and a homeless man sitting next to each other under mm. the tent. Mm. Because God is going to do the impossible, folks. And you've got to be ready for it. Wow, well, praise the Lord, that's awesome. You know, there were a lot of prophecies that went out that said that Donald Trump was gonna be elected for a second term and that the election results uh, uh, were gonna be overturned and, and that didn't happen. And uh, do you have a perspective on that that you could comment on? I think a lot of our viewers are wondering about that. Some of them are confused and, and even troubled by, by the, the prophets out there that it looks like they may have gotten it wrong, or at least some of them. Well, here's what I think. Uh, there's no answer that isn't going to make somebody mad. So, so you know, you got to decide what hill you're going to die on. So I'm going to tell you about 1 Samuel 14, the Bible, t uh, 2 Kings 14, forgive me. 2 Kings 14, we see the prophet Elisha, and he's dying. And the Bible tells us, that Joash the king said, the Syrians are gonna invade us, we need help, and we trust God. So the prophet said, made a prediction, you will defeat the Syrians till you have destroyed them. That's what it reads in the Amplified. You will do this. So that's a prediction. But then he handed him the arrows and said, beat on the ground. And the the, the, the parable of that, the what was going on is there was a connection between the force and the abundance. If you hit the ground enough, you'll destroy your enemy. It didn't mean that the, that the prophecy was conditional, but what it meant was, is here's a promise of God that you've got to latch on to, and here's what God is re going to do. Here's God's part, here's your part. In Daniel chapter 9, Daniel fasted and prayed after he determined that 70 years were up. He didn't assume it was automatic. Let mm. me tell you what I feel. I feel we had an incomplete response to a promise from God. Some prophets were false because they predicted Trump's victory 
without requiring the church to repent. They did not mingle the prophecy with the conditions. That's why 2 Chronicles 7, 14 begins with, if my people, then I'll heal your land. If they repent, turn from their wicked ways. What we did not do, we voted for Trump. Yes, we did that part. But we had a criminal conspiracy afoot that was demonic in its origin and in its force. And you know what that means? That means the church needed to rise up, take authority over the powers of Satan. But I think way too many Christians were seduced by false prophets who said, you know, you're blessed. It, it's not conditional. God's going to do it no matter what. It's going to be fine. And even in October, I was warning people Trump could lose. I never heard the word myself that Trump was going to serve a second term. But I believe certain voices that I had heard that were righteous. But I do believe that this is something, it's too easy to blame the prophets. The church also bears a responsibility in what happened. And, it, and we're seeing it now, aren't we? Because the church is not outraged enough. We can't leave guys like Mike Lindell hung, uh, you know, from my pillow out there on a string hanging by himself. That man should have the whole backing of the church right now. Now, whether his information is perfect or not, I don't know. But I know he's a man of God. I know he loves God and I know he loves America. And again, as I said, some people aren't going to like my answer, but that's what I believe happened. Wow. Well, thank you. I appreciate you sharing that and being so candid, Mario. I think that makes a lot of sense. Well, we have another question uh, that's come in here. Um, and I think we've, we've talked about some of this, but Mark on chat asks, can you comment about the efforts to deplatform Christians and conservative programming on cable TV? Where do we go from here? Should the church be, um, uh, you know, abandoning these platforms or uh, what should our response be? Well, the Bible is filled with resistance. Moses was not supposed to be born. Abraham was not supposed to be allowed to have a child. David was forbidden to kill a giant. Paul was told not to preach. Peter was told not to heal the sick. So we've always been against the grain, folks. This is not a new deal for us. What we've found is that the Christians have been late to the game. We should have built our own separate social network programs by now. Just as powerful as we've been to build these great churches with multi-campuses, we should have gotten together with all conservatives and long ago built something. We should never have allowed YouTube, Facebook, these devils, excuse me, to dominate the internet. And God, I think, is on the verge of giving the body of Christ faith. I, I hear that Trump is, you know, I hear these whispers that he's about to build a national social network of some kind. Well, if he doesn't, somebody should. And God would give the church the wealth of the wicked to do it if they just had the courage to do it. But, you know, we were overly spiritual. We got out of journalism. We got out of theater. We got out of art. We got out of intelligence. You know what it says in Daniel chapter one that I love? It says that Daniel was gifted in all literature. Mm. So he could comment not only on, on the Old Testament, but he could comment on, on what was going on. When I was at Berkeley, I understood something, that there were deposits of God in different ways, in different thoughts, that people were being moved and that it was up to the Christians to shed light on it. Vivid example, Mars Hill. Paul says, when I walked through your city, I noticed that you had all these shrines and idols. And I noticed one of the unknown God and uh, who you worship ignorantly. And then he said, as one of your own poets have said, we have the power to have a tongue of fire. And here's what Jesus said in Luke 21. He said, I will give you a mouth and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to gainsay nor resist. That power is still there to tell the leftists, the church is going to rise up. God's voice will never be stopped. And this is America. And America is a special miracle. And we're going to see a lot more. Amen. Amen. 
Good stuff. That's good. Well, um, so we've got another question here. This one comes in from Daniel on chat. Again, I think we've covered some of this, but maybe you could go in a little deeper. And he's asking, what is the church missing that is causing us to be asleep? How do we wake up? Well, this is what I believe has got to happen. And uh, the, you're not going to like this one, folks, but here it comes. If your pastor's not preaching that the Bible is the inerrant word of God, if he's muffling the Holy Spirit, he or she, if they are not allowing the gifts of power to flow, they're not calling people to be saved, they're not giving altar calls, run, change churches, get out of there as if it were nuclear waste and get to a house where God is at work and where the power is flowing. Now, I believe that I hear Christians all the time, they say, well, I don't want to appear unloving. You are understanding that you need to read 1 Corinthians 13 again and find out what is love. One of the things love is, the Bible says, love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Mm. The, love does not like sin. Love does not like carnality. Love does not like sitting in a pew while someone is up there entertaining you, but taking you nowhere and saying things like, oh, we're not going to get political. We're not going to preach against abortion because it's too political and it's too controversial. Let me tell you what's controversial. The most controversial phrase in the entire universe is this one. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There is nothing more polarizing than the gospel. Why is that? Because Satan hates it. And all of his string puppets and hand puppets start to manifest whenever truth is preached. We can't allow the idea that people don't like what we're saying to dictate what we say. And, uh, you know, I go on and on about that. But that's what's sleeping the church, is we need the eagles to leave the turkey yard today. Get around people of like mind who are pursuing Christ, who want power, who want fervor. It might be in your home. It might be in a small church. Maybe you left a church where you had accountability because you wanted the streamlined church, the 12-minute express service, the drive-by blessing. And I want to tell you what, get back under the fire of God. And then enough of us do it. They can't stop us all. If we come in unity, they can't stop us all. Wow, praise God. Well, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus here, but in the headlines in the last week, Max Lucado um, uh, was criticized for comments he made in some sermons previously about uh, homosexuality at the, was it the National Cathedral in Washington? Mm. And he's backed down on those and, and apologized. Have, I don't know if you've seen those headlines or not, but he, he apologized for supposedly hurtful comments he made uh, where he basically indicated, you know, that God's version, God, marriage according to the word of God is a man and a woman, not a man and a man or woman and a woman and, and these kinds of things. And, and now he's backing off of that, saying it was hurtful and insensitive. Have you seen those headlines and do you have any thoughts about that? Is that kind of the typical thing that we're facing here and, and, uh, and, and we, can't, we can't allow that? Yeah, well, he's uh, so open-minded his brains fell out. And I, I'm going to say it in love. And I'm going to comment on this. If I have a doctor that looked at the x-ray and said that I had a malignant tumor, and instead he tells me I have a hangnail, and then if I get a little sleep, take a couple aspirin, I'm going to be okay. When we tell the gay community that there isn't freedom in Christ, we're being cruel. Yes. We're not being mean when we tell them the truth. We're being cruel. Because here's what Max is not considering. The hurt that you're preventing is not right. You're allowing the big hurt in the name of the little hurt. Mm -hmm. What is the big hurt? They can't, they're not under conviction for the tortured life they're leading. The, the suicide rate among transsexuals is so high. And we say, well, we ought to be loving toward them. You know that there is a, a dysphoria that people have where they want their arms cut off or their legs cut off. It's a psychological dysphoria. Now, should a surgeon try to normalize that? 
call, do the surgery for a perfectly logically healthy person, take, cut off their arm because they are so obsessed with the idea that they need to have an amputation. That same logic applies to every part of preaching. When someone is in sin, they need to know it. When they're bound for hell, they need to know it. When they have a disorder, a dysphoria, a, a, a misconception that the scriptures clearly lay out, and we want to prevent them from feeling hurt, we're actually preventing them from getting well. And that is the cruelest thing I can imagine. You know what you just said, Mario? I'm thinking of, uh, Richard, a, a story that Andrew Womack told one time, and I've repeated it several times. He was talking to someone and they asked him a question and Andrew just had the sense that they weren't going to like the answer because you know Andrew, he's going to share the word. But he was, he was hesitating and, and thinking maybe, maybe not sharing that. And the Lord spoke to Andrew and said, Andrew, tell them the truth. Let them have the opportunity to reject the truth. Don't you reject it for them. And wow. I, th I think that's the problem mm -hmm. with the world today. And, and Mario, while you were talking, I have to borrow that quote from um, Francis Schaeffer once again, what he said about abortion clinics. He said, in front of every abortion clinic, there needs to be a sign here by permission of the church. Everything we've been talking about tonight, we can't blame the Democrats, the liberals, uh, the different ones. The, the blame goes squarely upon the church because Jesus said, we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. You know, I, I said this again Sunday in church. <clears throat> we have a place up here, Mario, called Cave of the Winds. They take you down in there and then they turn the lights off. It is the darkest place I've ever been. You cannot see your hand in front of your face. There is zero light there. Well, you could go down there right now, but if you give me a little match and I light it up, it overcomes that darkness around me. And if I need to overcome more darkness, I just bring in more light. And you know, it's getting dark out in this world right now, but I'm telling you, we are the light of the world and we always overcome light if we'll let it shine. And Richard, we're winding down here. I tell you, this is the fastest hour we've had in a long time, Mario. Mm -hmm. We want to thank you for being with us. Yeah. And really, from the depth of our heart, Mario, thank you, brother, for being bold, yeah. uncompromising, and a bright light, and particularly where you're at, a lot of darkness. And we just thank God for you. I'm so glad your mother was not, didn't, we wasn't allowed to get that abortion and she just put that Bible on her belly. She's still bearing the fruit of it now, even as she's in heaven. Thank you, Mario, for being with us. Well, Brother Mark, Brother Richard, you two are tremendous brothers in Christ. And uh, I thank God for this opportunity. This is a deep honor for me, especially to be with Andrew Womack. He is a great man of God that I respect and admire so deeply. Well, well I, I, can I throw in, y'all be sure and sign up for Mario's blog, mariomarillo.org, and, uh, and get tuned into his ministry. And hopefully we can get a report back after this pastor's meeting. Amen. We're, yes. out of, we're out of time, but I want to thank you for joining us on the broadcast. We'll see you next week. Join us next time for the Truth and Liberty broadcast. Find tonight's episode and related articles and links at truthandliberty.net. Truth and Liberty is viewer supported. If you'd like to help us continue our live casts, you can make a donation at truthandliberty.net. 